All right. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you once again, and we've enjoyed it. Just this conference has been a, such a refreshment for my family and I. We have enjoyed speaking to many of you, and we've enjoyed the food. Uh, my kids have enjoyed meeting new friends, and we are just excited to be part of this this uh, missions conference. And Pastor asked me to give a, another brief testimony about us and our family and about Israel. Many of us are familiar with a passage in Genesis 12, verse 3, where God is speaking with his friend Abraham. And he gives them this, this incredible promise that, I, uh, that you, you need to believe that is still true today. Uh, Genesis 12, 3, the Bible says, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all of the families of the earth be, be blessed. Just a while ago in the Sunday school hour, I was speaking with a Spanish class, and we are talking about this verse about how the world has been tremendously blessed because of what God has done through the Jewish people. If we talk about technology, if we talk about science, if we talk about all of these things, the world has been, has been blessed because of Israel. But also, if we, if we look at it spiritual-wise, we have been greatly blessed because of the Jewish people. We have our Bibles. We have our Bibles. Praise the Lord, we have a Bible. We have them in our language. We can read them, understand them, see God's will for our lives. But God trusted the Jewish people with the scriptures, with, with his word. And, and God has also provided us salvation through the Jewish people. How many of us in here, you know, you personally, you know a Jewish person? Raise your hand. Oh, quite a few, quite a few. There's still a lot of hands who are not raised. If you do not know a Jewish person, I would love to introduce you to one. He is my best friend and probably the most very famous Jewish person in all of history. His name is Lord Jesus. I, I, I hope you've heard of him before. How I many of you have heard of Jesus before? All right. You have, it's good that you've heard of him before. He is a Jewish person. He came in Jewish flesh. He died in Jewish flesh. And he, when he rose again, he rose again in Jewish flesh. So we have been greatly blessed because of what God has done through the Jewish people. But right before that promise, he said, I will curse them that curse thee. That promise is still active today. I was speaking with the Spanish class talking about <clears throat> the testimony of Hugo Chavez. Hugo Chavez was that dictator of, of Venezuela. And in one conference, um, press conference he was giving, he was talking about Israel, and he said in Spanish, desde lo más profundo de mis vísceras, maldigo a la nación de Israel. He said, from the most bottom part of my belly, I, I curse the land of Israel, and I curse its people, and, and curse its land, and all of the people that were there with him, all of them applauded what he was saying, and obviously that wasn't uh, something good in the, in the sight of God. A few months later, Hugo Chavez was diagnosed with, with cancer. And uh, how many of you know where, where that cancer started in, in, in him? It started in his, in his belly, in his stomach, stomach cancer. And he, he searched for medical doctors. He searched for miracles. He went to Christian churches. He went to visit witch doctors, a lot of different things, but nobody could ever help him. Well, simply, the Bible says, I will curse them that curseth thee. Uh, is that promise still active today? Uh, you better believe it is. But if that is active today, how much more is the first promise? The Bible says, I will bless them that blesseth thee. How many of us want God's blessing on our lives? How many of us want that blessing? Wow. God in his, in his word, he has given us many promises where he said, hey, if you do this, I promise you do this, right? If you call upon the name of the Lord, thou shalt be saved. And a lot of these different promises that are conditional, this is one of them. If you bless the Jewish people, bless Israel, God will bring some special tidings to your life. Now, the question is, how can we bless Israel? How can we bless Israel? A few things I want to mention here quickly. First of all, one, one way is to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The Bible says in Psalm 122, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, they shall prosper that love thee. How many of us has really genuinely just have, make a simple prayer for the peace of Jerusalem? Many times we forget that and we need to have an, a habit of praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Because when we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, what we're really praying for is the salvation of the Jewish people. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 10 verse 1 that his heart's desire and his prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. When we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we're actually praying that the Jewish people might meet their long-awaited Messiah, the one that Isaiah called the Prince of Peace. So pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Second of all, we have to give them the gospel. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 1, 16, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is a power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew 
first and also to the Greek. Every church should have a priority in trying to reach the Jewish people with the gospel. That is, that's just a need. That is a responsibility that every Christian person has. And, uh, <clears throat> and the last thing, how can we bless Israel? Well, first, we need to pray for them. We need to give them the gospel. But third of all, there's a very interesting story in Luke chapter 7 where there's this centurion and he has a, a servant that's very sick and it's about to die. And he's, he, he doesn't want to go see Jesus personally. So he sends a few of the Jewish people and they come to Jesus and they're in Luke chapter 7 verse 3 and 5. I just want to read this real quickly. It says, and when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servants. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. The Jewish people came to Jesus they said, and said, hey, you need to answer this man's prayer. You need to hear what he has to say. Please do this for him because he is worthy because he loves our nation. He loves us so much that he built us a synagogue. Now, I'm not going to say we're going to go out and build synagogues all over the place. No, no, no. But it's just simple. This, this, we need to use our goods, the things that God has blessed us with, to bless the people of Israel. Uh, I remember in, in, during the Hanukkah or during the Christmas time this last year, uh, my wife and I, we went to Dunkin' Donuts. We bought three dozen donuts. And we went to a, a mall. And in this mall, there's a few Jewish people working there. And uh, we went there, and we knew that they were celebrating Hanukkah. And during Hanukkah, they eat a lot of uh, donuts and cookies and things like that. So we just went over there. We went to meet them. And we said, hey, uh, are you a Jewish person? He said, yeah, we're from Israel. Great. We love the Jewish people. We are praying for you constantly. And we brought you donuts. And you should see their eyes. Their eyes just open. They're like, what? Donuts. And why are you giving us donuts? We said, well, uh, aren't you celebrating Hanukkah? They said, yes, we are celebrating Hanukkah. Uh, well, don't you eat donuts in Hanukkah? I said, yes, we eat. How did you know all this? We said, well, we love you guys, and we're praying for you every single day. We had, this gave us a great opportunity. They opened their hearts, they're open, gave us an opportunity to present the Lord Christ to them. They did not receive Jesus, but the seed of the gospel was, 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 was planted there in their hearts. And we pray for them that the Lord might bring them to salvation. But you see, these gifts that we can give them are opportunities for us to share the gospel of Christ. One thing is to say that we love the Jewish person, but the other thing is to actually show it with our deeds and with our actions. This is another way to bless Israel. And um, I am part of a mission board. I am part of the, uh, the International Board of Jewish Missions. I believe a lot of you met uh, Dr. Gardenhouse. He was a Jewish Christian who started this mission board. And this mission board, this primary, um, the, the, the main um, goal of the mission is to share the gospel with the Jewish people. There are many organizations out there that will tell you that that if you help them and support them, you will be blessing the Jewish people. But a lot of them don't believe that the Jewish people need to hear the gospel. They think that they, that they don't need to hear the gospel, that they are going to be saved some other way. But the, the only way anybody, Jew or Gentile, is going to be saved is through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you would like to invest, I'm going to show this, this, this small video about our mission board and just different ministries that the mission board has that can uh, help you and equip you to pray for Israel to learn about how to evangelize your Jewish neighbor, but also giving you opportunities to be able to bless Israel with your deeds, right? And after this video, I'm just going to give a, just a quick two testimony uh, after this video. If you can put this video, if it's available right there. Thank you. Was preceded by an explosion. explosion. Within the heart of every man lies the desire for peace, shalom, peace, the elusive goal for man for nations, sought after with force, aggression, treaties and promises. For the Jewish people, peace is a dream that has never been a lasting reality. For centuries, 
persecution has dealt a fierce hand to the dispersed Jewish people. The Crusades, the Inquisition, pogroms, and the Holocaust have cast their dark shadows over Jewish history. These tragedies have caused the Jewish mind to question why they are the chosen people. And in their struggles, some wonder if they really are the chosen people. Today, there are an estimated 14 million Jewish people scattered throughout the world. Though small in number, they are a special people, loving and hardworking. These are the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a covenant people of whom the Bible says, The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. God loves his people and uses them to be a blessing to all. They have given the world two great gifts of eternal value, the Word of God and the God of the Word, the Messiah. The thirst for peace is the yearning of the Jewish soul. Shalom, a word that means peace, the idea of completeness, wholeness. God promised that true shalom would come to Israel through the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, and His coming was foretold throughout the Hebrew Scriptures. God has provided atonement, yet the Jewish people remain bound by traditions and without hope, without Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Since 1949, International Board of Jewish Missions has proclaimed the Gospel of the Messiah to the Jewish people around the world. This unique work was started by Dr. Jacob Gardenhouse. He was born in Austria and trained to be a rabbi. However, his life was completely changed when he trusted Jesus as Messiah. His life's passion is reflected in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. If God could perform that miracle in my life, He can do the same in every Jew if they had a chance to hear the gospel explained to them. And now the ministry of IBJM with that same passion has grown throughout the world. There are now people being ministered to from South Africa to South America, from Australia to Europe. My name is Mark Oshman. I was brought up as an Orthodox Jew, yet I received Jesus as my Messiah while in the Air Force. I covet your prayers for the peace of Jerusalem and the salvation of the Jewish people. My name is Hagit Yermiao. I was born and raised in Israel into a traditional Jewish family. I came to know the Lord Jesus as my Messiah while translating a track from English to Hebrew. And I pray and hope that someone will go and reach out to my people, the Jewish people. Thank you. The sheer number of Jewish communities around the world would require a host of laborers to reach them. That's why the Lord commanded the local church to reach the Jewish people with the gospel. And a good number of churches are now responding to this opportunity and sending missionaries to go around the world and also to reach the Jewish people in their own communities. Our response should be one of love and compassion. God told Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. The greatest way you can bless the Jewish people is to lovingly share the gospel of the Messiah with them. IBJM is assisting local churches by providing specialized training, literature, and mission opportunities. Unreached Jewish communities remain throughout the world. Time is short, and there is a desperate need to answer the call before it is too late. The Jewish world is looking for peace, shalom. Some have found peace through the Messiah. So the task is great and the time is short. What will you do to obey God's call in reaching Jewish people with the gospel? Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for Israel that they might be saved. While well, I was pastoring in, in, in Mexico, in Piedras Negras, I served there for six years, a year as an assistant, and the next, next five years as pastor of the church. The Lord really blessed that ministry. We had big days of, of up to 700 people, and a normal Sunday we would be running about 115 people in attendance. The Lord was really uh, blessing the church in a great way. But it wasn't until one, this truth of the Jewish people, uh, of their need of the gospel, that, that really struck my heart. And I knew the Lord was moving my heart to work with, within the Jewish people and try to reach them with the gospel. 
I thought, God, you no, know, I'm, I'm already in my church. I'm already established. You're blessing this ministry. Why do you want me to go? The Lord has answered that through many, many different ways. But the, the thing I want to mention, this, this last thing right here. Maybe you are, you are just like as I was when I was hearing this need and, and your heart just is burning right now with that desire to share the gospel with everyone, yes, but specifically with a Jewish person. Not only pray for the peace of Jerusalem, not only, play, not only uh, uh, seek to give them the gospel, not only uh, try to bless them with deeds, but pray that the Lord might raise up laborers. Out of uh, the, the statistics say that of all the missionaries that go into the world, less than 1% go to the Jewish people. We are praying for more labor. We are praying for more soul winners, more church planters, or more missionaries who will go to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Please pray for us. We are the Patino family. Uh, we have our prayer cards here on the table. We have different things that might help you, assist you to reaching out to your Jewish neighbor as well. Thank you for your time. We've enjoyed being here, Pastor. Thank you for your time. God bless you all. Thank you. este mundo perdido comparte lo que ahora eres comparte a quien te salvó mucho soy camina en tristeza y aflicción mucho buscan y buscan y vacía sus vidas está tú tienes ya la respuesta Cristo ahora vive en ti Cristo llevó tus cargas Cristo te dio
I'm still getting over having cried through that last song. <laughs> Greater things have yet to be, un- be done. So please forgive me. I want to share one of the great things that God did in Eugene, Oregon. This is from our last year of travels. I was sitting in an exchange seminar, and um, I got, you know, Jeff and I do role playing as we're teaching people how to share the gospel. And I had the privilege of doing that night the matchless love of Christ. And so I was role playing the gospel with Jeff. And I sat down, and the woman beside me, I'd been sitting by her all week. Her name was Renee. And she says to me, That's the part that got me. And I said, What do you mean? And she goes, Well, that's when I understood what Jesus did for me, and I trusted him as, Christ, as Savior. And I said, Renee, tell me your story. Here I, all week long, I'd thought I'd been sitting by someone who had been saved for a long time. And I want to share Renee's story with you. It is so beautiful. She grew up in a denomination that offered no assurance of salvation. And her question constantly was, how many works are enough? How do I know if my good is going to outweigh my bad? So eventually, Renee fell into just a state of hopelessness because of that false teaching. She totally gave up on church. And her thought was this, what's the use? So years passed for Renee, and she had a hard life. And some really tragic things took place in her life. And one of those was that her daughter, who at this time was about, I think, 18 years old, she was a severe asthmatic. And Renee just was just really troubled. Her whole spirit was troubled. She had a wicked, sinful lifestyle. Nothing she had tried was bringing any satisfaction. And now she was facing really the imminent death of her daughter. And a man came to her door with a gospel tract. He gave that gospel tract to Renee, and all she read on it was the address and the name of the church. She saw that it was from a Baptist church. And so she connected with her sister, her sister Darlene. And Darlene was actually a member of the church where eventually I met Renee. She saw in there the Baptist church, so she called her sister. Now, mind you, her sister had kind of separated herself from Renee because Renee was living such an ungodly lifestyle that her sister kind of, they were estranged from each other. So you can imagine her sister Darlene's surprise when she gets a phone call from Renee. And Renee says to her, somebody gave me a gospel tract, and it has this name of this Baptist church on it. Is that your church? (laughs) Well, it wasn't Darlene's church, but Darlene said, well, why don't you come visit with me? So the next Sunday, Renee went to that church there in Eugene, Oregon, and God began to soften her heart. Well, it's just, I have no idea, because at this time, these people in, in their church, as far as Jeff and I knew, they knew nothing about the exchange, but someone in the church had a copy of our Bible study. It's a four-lesson Bible study. Many of you have done it. I praise the Lord. A four-lesson Bible study for unbelievers. And so this was given to Darlene, Darlene and Darlene invited her sister, Renee, to do that four-lesson Bible study with her. Um, She completed, uh, after lesson three, where we talk about that amazing exchange where Jesus Christ offers to take our sin and to give us his righteousness, that was the day when it clicked for Renee. And that's when she trusted Jesus Christ as her Savior. So Renee shared this whole story with me, and I was just so blessed. But the cool thing is, shortly after our seminar, I had learned that Renee had trusted Jesus Christ during the Exchange Bible Study. She sent me a picture, which I don't have up here on the screen, but it's a picture of her getting baptized. So here, she trusted Christ. She got trained in evangelism. She's been baptized, and just a few weeks ago, Jeff and I were in Eugene, Oregon, and we sat down with her pastor, Grave Kaminsky, and his wife, And they shared beautiful stories of Renee and the many people that she has led to Christ and is bringing into the church, and they are getting baptized. And one of them specifically, she wrote me about it, was her sister-in-law, Kathy. And as her sister-in-law, through Renee's gospel witness, saw lesson three again, the beautiful story of God's love, she says to Renee, she says, I get it. 
There is nothing I can do to get myself to heaven. It's all Jesus. So praise the Lord for someone who was saved, baptized, and is now giving the gospel to other people, doing that beautiful circle of ministry, which is all of our, our personal goal. Well, I feel like we could give an invitation and go home, but we won't. <laughs> that was just a great uh, worship service that we shared together. Um, I, I, I have enjoyed every moment of it thus far. And just to recognize the work that Jesus Christ is doing. Someone mentioned to me this morning, actually I had two different people mention to me this morning, that the enemy is much at work. And certainly we recognize that. I, I, don't even like saying this, but I mentioned, and I shouldn't have, uh, that uh, it seems like the devil has the ability to get into technology more than anything else. I've never, never quite understood how he gets into our wires, uh, but uh, I, one of the things that blessed me, uh, I, I, I told our friend that told me that, you know, the Bible tells us greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. When, when the devil starts attacking, we, we need not be afraid because we have the victory. In fact, it almost gives me a little bit of encouragement to know that the Lord knows the great things that he wants to be doing. That song that was sung was so beautiful to know that we do have great things to look forward to. We're going to talk about that this morning, but there's stuff to do right now. And I, I get excited about that, and I hope you get excited about that. Take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, we're going to actually work our way through Revelation 4 and 5, the chapters 4 and 5. It's going to be a reading uh, uh, message this morning. Um, this book is the last installment of the Bible. The Bible is God's self-revelation of himself. It's progressive. And so it begins with in the beginning God. God tells us about himself and throughout the Bible he's given us the, the, the word of God so that we could know him. Frankly, the book of the Revelation is the completion of the Bible and, and the, the book of the Revelation cannot be thoroughly understood without a thorough knowledge of the rest of the Bible. But I also believe that the rest of the Bible cannot be thoroughly understood without a working knowledge of the book of the Revelation. And uh, uh, by the way, when you hear the word apocalypse, I'm a picture person. I see pictures when I hear words. What, what pictures come before your mind when you hear the word apocalypse? It's interesting, this title that you see written on the uh, uh, screen is the title of this book. And if you were to read it in Greek, it would say, Apocalypsis Jesus Christos. And literally, the apocalypse, the revelation. When it, the word re apocalypse is not talking about uh, 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 the climactic end of the word of God. It's talking about Jesus being revealed to us. This book is the unveiling of the glorified Savior. We have learned about him all throughout Scripture. We know about him, but here for the very first time, we see Jesus unveiled in all of his glory. And it is a fascinating book, and it is a fascinating revelation. So the book is actually a narrative in three parts. The, uh, the first part is in chapter 1, and in chapter 1, Jesus reveals himself to the person of John in his glorified state. Now, this is interesting because he is so awe-inspiring in his glorified state that the beloved disciple who laid his head on the chest of Jesus at the Last Supper now falls at his feet like a dead man. Chapter 1 bears reading. 
chapter 2, by the way, you can go ahead and turn to this next screen because I forgot to read it. There's a blessing that is attached to this book. It says, blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things that are written therein. So God promised a special blessing for us today as we read and hear the word of God. Chapters 2 and 3 make up the second part of this particular uh, book, and uh, uh, the, it, it is talking to us about Jesus in the church age. In fact, there are seven letters to seven churches representing our church age. And Jesus here is shown in the midst of the church, guiding, empowering, disciplining, cheering, and mourning. It gives us unparalleled motivation to overcome the prevailing weaknesses of the church and Christianity in our day. Parts one and two of this book are all written from Earth's perspective. But chapter four, where we're going to begin today, and you can turn to 4 1, chapter four begins part three, and the perspective changes here. Let me see if I can paint a picture that will help us take our eyes off of our own earthly existence this morning off of the bitter taste of school violence, the growing hatred that is against all that is good, the gnawing fear of the loss of this dear, beloved country that we see slipping away from us, off of the rumble of our stomach that already reminds us that human hunger is really never satisfied. Off of the wandering of our minds that comes from a busy work schedule, crowded family commitments, looming bills, and a million other things that scream to us from our American lifestyle demanding our attention. Imagine for a moment the churches meeting across North America and Europe today. Many of them look just like ours, and many of them don't. Now imagine the churches across Southeast Asia, South and Central America. And we're talking about some major similarities and some major differences. Let your mind roam to the full-throated praises rising out of the believers in Southern and Central Africa the tight security of churches meeting in secret in northern Africa, Middle East, and much of China. Now imagine all of those churches and every tribe, tongue, and ethnic group hearing the same clarion call. You see, no one has to stop to ask what's happening, because this is the moment we're all waiting for. This is the beginning of the life that we were created for. At that instant, each soul sees Jesus. Now it's interesting because there's a host of angels come back with him. The dead in Christ are being raised to meet him, but none is staring at those because they cannot take their eyes off of the glorious, risen Savior, come to take us home. That's how the church age will end, and the scene that is before us in Revelation chapter 4 begins. These two chapters, all all of these chapters, but these two chapters that we will look at this morning were written to reveal Jesus to us. And I believe he is seen in this passage in a way we see him nowhere else in Scripture. There are four things that we're going to notice about him this morning. Number one, we're going to notice that God is completely holy. He cannot tolerate sin. That God is absolutely just. He cannot overlook our sin. He has to judge it. But that God is outrageously loving, and he's reached out to us. He's provided a way for us to be close to him that satisfies the demands of his holy, just nature. And finally, God is amazingly, gloriously gracious, and he offers salvation as a gift. This Bible reading will... We'll read every verse in verses 
4 and 5, but we'll also make some references to some other passages that kind of help clarify for us. Number one, let's look at the fact that God is completely holy. And in Revelation verses uh, uh, 4, verses 1 through 3, we see, first of all, the beauty of His holiness. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice that I heard, which was like a trumpet talking to me, said, Come up hither, and I will show you things that must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and I behold a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat upon the throne uh, was to look upon like a jasper or a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight likened to an emerald. Could you imagine the startling contrast between John's harsh conditions in the labor camp that he was on in the island of Patmos, and now this scene of incomparable majesty and beauty before him. It is interesting that the preeminent feature of heaven is one sitting on a throne. The throne in heaven immediately established God's role as sovereign over all. Whatever is happening here on earth is not up for grabs. We need not panic or fret. There's a throne in heaven, and the one on the throne is ruling, and he's been ruling from eternity past, and he will continue to rule into eternity future. His impact is not one of facial features, but colors. We see the crystal clear of a dazzling diamond, the brilliant red of a ruby red, the emanating aura of emerald green, each flashing facets of perfect, pristine, pure splendor of God's holiness. Not only do we see that God's holiness is beautiful, but God's holiness drastically impacts our relationship to Him. In verses 4 and 5, we see the relationship of holiness and the representatives of the redeemed round about the throne were four and twenty seats, or thrones. And upon the seats, I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. These representative saints wearing the victor's crowns and the clothes of the redeemed, they appear to have already stood before the bema seat of Christ because they're already in the rewarded clothes of the redeemed. And then we see the outworking of the throne in verse 5, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices, and there were seven lamps of the fire burning before the throne. These are the seven spirits of God. This is not a passive sovereign. We see the constant, awesome work of the throne side by side, the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. This picture, I'm I'm a picture person, and so when I see this picture, it reminds me of another picture in Scripture, Mount Sinai, where God gave to us the law and revealed to us His holy nature. Listen to this description in Exodus 19. And there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a voice of a trumpet exceeding loud so that the people uh, uh, of the camp trembled. And then in this passage in verse 6, we see the transcendent nature of God. And before the throne was a sea of glass likened to crystal. We really don't know exactly what this crystal sea is, but it visually reminds us of the transcendent nature of God. No one can be holy like God is holy. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. Ecclesiastes 7.20, there's not a just man on the earth that does good and doesn't sin. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then in verse 6, we go on to see the worshipers in the throne room, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts, or creatures, full of eyes before and behind. These living beings, described here in several other passages of Scripture throughout the Bible, let us know that earth-bound words fail to comprehend or to capture the beauty and the spectacular nature of these supernatural beings in God's eternal realm. 
It is fitting that this scene in heaven culminates with worship because God's holiness demands worship. In verses 7 and 8, we see the worship of the angels. And the four beasts, each of them had six wings about them. They were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. It's interesting that this same picture we see in Isaiah chapter 6. And I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train, or that visible aura, filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphim. Each of them had six wings. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Now, there are 2,600 years between the scene that we see in Isaiah and the scene that we see in Revelation chapter 4. And there are angels in this scene crying out the same thing for 2,600 years and probably before that. So one of two things is true about these angels. Either they are bored stiff by now, or God's holiness is so awesome that even after 2,600 years, these angels cannot help but cry out afresh and anew, glorifying the beauty of God's holy nature. John MacArthur has said, Holiness is the only one of God's attributes so repeated since it is the summation of all that He is. You see, God's holiness is His complete separation from sin. He is unequivocally untainted by any form of evil. Isaiah voices our earthbound response to God's holiness in the next verse when he says, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amidst, uh, amongst the people of unclean lips. In verses 9 through 11, we see the worship of the redeemed join into the worship of these angels. And whenever the beast of the, uh, gave glory and honor to him that sits on the throne who lives forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat upon the throne and worship him that lives forever. And they cast their crowns before his throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. This, my friend, is the ongoing rapture-filled worship of heaven. There's much that we're not noting in these two chapters because our focus is on what God is revealing to us about himself so that we can know him. These first two chapters, or these two chapters four, and five make up the greatest oratorio of all time. This first movement began with the angelic quartet, is now added with the ensemble of the redeemed, and we could call this first movement of this great oratorio the creation hymn. Now John notices something in the hand of the one on the throne that demands his attention in chapter 5 and verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book or a scroll written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And in chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, we're going to see that God is absolutely just. And we see here the intrusion of sin into God's perfectly created world. You see the the question that must come to our minds as a person, and, and you'll find this when you begin to teach people the beauty of God's holiness and his awesome nature of sovereign. Often they ask themselves, okay, here's a logical question. If God is great and God is good, then why is there so much suffering and evil in this world? And the answer is, God didn't create the world this way. God created a perfect, pure world. But we humans 
chose to sin and plunged this world, our world, into the curse of sin. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men, because all have sinned. You see, God hates sin. And in His justice, He must rid this world of sin and its accompanying curse. In Revelation chapter 21, verses 4 and 5, the Bible tells us that when God does that, God will wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away, and he that sat upon the throne shall say, Behold, I make all things new. In this passage, we see the need for a judge. The scroll that we see in verse 1 contains God's blueprint for justice, to rid the world of sin and its curse. God in His justice has pronounced a plan to wipe the world clean of all of the vestiges of sin. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 says, The day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That is God's promised command about sin and its curse. Yet, God, in His love and mercy, has restrained His wrath against sin for a time. You see, if He wiped sin clean as soon as it entered into, every hum- or into, lo- into the world, every human would perish because every human is guilty of sin. The verse prior to this one says that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise as some men count slackness but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Sometimes we look around and we say, whoa, you know, why is this world so bad? It's because sin is here, and God is allowing sin to continue for a season because He longs for the sinner to come to repentance. All creation is laboring under this curse of sin and is longing for God's justice to free it from the curse of sin. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 and following tells us that the suffering of this present time is is the result of the empty promises of sin. It goes on to say that the creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty. I loved that song this morning and that song over and over and over, Libertas, that we're going to have liberty. And we already live in that liberty, the liberty of the children of God. For we know the whole creation groans and travails in the pain together until now. You see, heaven itself is ready for God's wrath to be poured out against sin. The Bible tells us that in in Psalm chapter 9, the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared His throne for judgment. Then He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Could you imagine with me for a moment this scene in heaven the parapet of heaven, and on the parapet of heaven is an army of angels mounted on horses. And you know what horses do when they get impatient. You can see them pawing the streets of gold and rattling those harnesses of gold. And, uh, and you can even hear among the angels a murmur of restlessness as they say, How long, Lord? How long? There's a giant angel seated at the front of that army, and he's got his hand on the hilt of his sword, and he's looking back to the one on the throne. And he's waiting for the one on the throne to say, now. And when he says now, what we see unveiled for us in chapter 6 through the rest of this book will begin. Now, I don't know if that's what it looks like, but I do know this. All of heaven is simply waiting for the one on the throne to say, now. No wonder, Job said, 
Shall not His excellency or majesty make you afraid and His dread fall upon you? But we see that this blueprint for justice needs an executor, one who will execute the plan to rid the world of sin and its curse. Look at verse 2. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereon? And no one in heaven or on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither look thereon. This blueprint for justice culminates in the glorious return of the executor as jury and judge, ridding the world of sin and its curse. And so John says, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open the book, neither to look thereon. And in verse 5, we see the entrance of the judge. He says to us, one of the elders said to me, weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. You see, as lion, Jesus Christ is sovereign and judge. He is the picture of the government of God's justice. But as soon as we see the picture of the judge, we now shift and see that God is also outrageously loving. And we see the entrance at the exact same moment of the judged. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all of the earth. As lamb, Christ is Savior and judged. He is the picture of the exchange of God's love and grace. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. You see, Christ's execution of God's blueprint for justice will culminate in His glorious return to earth with His bride, and He will destroy the host of evil with one word from His mouth. And then we begin in verse 8 to see the exaltation of the Savior, first by the redeemed in verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the twenty and four elders fell down before the Lamb, having in their hands uh, every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. This, my friend, is the second movement of this great oratorio. We could call this one the redemption hymn. And we see that it started by the redeemed ensemble, but now it's with full orchestration. And little by little, we recognize the voices of others. The voice of a mother, a pastor, a precious old saint in a nursing home, a child by his bed, his dad next to him. The chorus grows louder and louder as all the saints on earth Join heaven's most powerful worship song through prayer. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for you were slain and was redeemed and has redeemed by God or to us. Excuse me, for you were slain, and you hast redeemed us unto God, uh, to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he exchanged places with us. God poured out his wrath against sin on Jesus. He died the death I deserve. And he invites us. To exchange places with him, to let him take our penalty and let us have his beautiful righteousness. You see, no one can stand in the presence of God without perfect righteousness. God can't tolerate one sin. Jesus offers you his perfect righteousness. 
if you'll just simply trust his finished work on the cross for you. The Bible tells us that God made Jesus to become sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of Jesus in him. That, my friend, is outrageous love. In fact, the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. His loving exchange not only removed our sins and redeems our souls, but his resurrection transforms our life. Look at the redemption song in verse 10. And has made us unto God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And now we see this song joined by all creation. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders, and the number of them were 10,000 times 10,000 thousands, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and, and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under earth and such as are in the sea and all that in them are, are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits on the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, amen. And with this song, Jesus Christ is elevated to equality with God and will now begin the execution of the blueprint for justice. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that lives forever and ever. I want to stop here before we move on to God's grace and review just one scene that we saw. As lion, Christ is sovereign and judge. He is the picture of the government of God's justice. As lamb, Christ is savior and judged. He is the picture of the exchange of God's love and grace. Jesus is both of these. But he will be one or the other to you. He will either stand as your judge and condemn you because of your sin, or he will stand as the one judged in your place and embrace you as his own. It's interesting that in this book, designed to reveal to us Jesus Christ, he is called the lion once, and he is called the lamb 28 times. He is showing us how much He loves us. In chapter 6 and verse 1, Jesus, the executor of the blueprint of justice, opens the first seal of the scroll and thus begins seven long years of the wrath of God being poured out on a sinful world. As I read through the book of the Revelation and I see that these seven seals, the last seal begins seven trumpets and the last trumpet begins seven bowls, I ask myself, why such a slow, arduous process? And why would God be so cruel? That's me looking at it from my earthbound perspective. But I'll tell you why God waits so long. It's almost as if he gets to the end of the seventh seal and he says, oh no, we need more time. And he gets to the end of the seventh trumpet and he says, oh no, we need more time. Because even in judgment, God is calling the rebels to repent. And we see in this book of judgment, God's amazing grace because he gives the rebellious a chance to repent. You see, God could have culminated his justice and his swift return of Jesus at this point, but still he tarries. The heart of love for his people and the just fulfillment of his promises to Israel demands that he sends a catalyst into the equation. The great tribulation demonstrates to the sinful world God's holy and just nature 
in order to give humans on earth time and motive to repent. In chapter 7, we see 144 evangelists come to the world to preach the gospel to the whole world. Israel as a nation is going to recognize Jesus as their Messiah. Millions on earth are going to be saved from wrath through repentance. They recognize the curse of their sins and turn to God, while others, Revelation 16, 21, blaspheme God because of the plague, for the plague was exceeding great. Revelation 17, 14, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, because He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and they are... Uh, uh, they that are with him are called chosen and faithful. In Revelation 19, Jesus returns to earth and finally rids the world of sin and its curse and now begins to rule as its rightful ruler. And I want you to recognize something, friend. This, everything we've said so far has been said so that we could see this. Because Jesus Christ had the power to do what he is going to do on that day ever since his resurrection. But he is waiting for more to repent because of his amazing grace. No wonder he left us these parting words. All authority is given unto me, both in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore... Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth. All power, all authority. Go, make disciples, build the church. Not only does Jesus give sinners a chance to repent, but in this age, he gives us, the church, the chance to invite Jesus gives a promise at the end of the book. After the description of the judgment of Satan and his followers, after the description of our eternal home with God in heaven, Jesus ends the book with this promise, Behold, I come quickly. That promise is glorious to those of us who know him. We humans were made for this eternal loving relationship with God. Every longing of the human soul is actually a longing for heaven and Jesus. Yet this same promise is terrifying to those who do not know him. Revelation chapter 20, verse 14 and 15, And death and hell shall be cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. In, chapters 22, or in chapter 22, the last book of the Bible, verses 14 and 15, God gives us a glimpse of two groups of people, those who are blessed and may enter in through the gates of heaven, and those who are excluded because they love their sin more than the Savior. And Jesus gives us an invitation. You see, God made humans for a loving relationship with Him. He has commissioned us, a church filled with His Holy Spirit, to spend this age pleading with humans, come back to God. Do you see it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20? Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. Come back to God. The last message of this book, Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, and the Spirit and the bride, that's the church filled with the Holy Spirit, says, come. Let him that hears say, come. Let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will may take of the water of life freely. And I think it's interesting that the very last words of this last book revealing God to the world are the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Jesus is lion and lamb. 
And he's given us, the church, the responsibility to spread that message of love, the love of the Lamb to the world. The question is, what will you do about it? I'd like to leave us today with a new 30-day challenge. The idea is that by God's grace, in the next 30 days, I will either give the gospel to someone or invite someone to do the exchange Bible study with me. You see, this work of evangelism doesn't stop. It goes on and on because the urgent passion of God. I believe this. I believe that one day the last soul will be saved and immediately we will hear the trumpet because God in his grace is waiting for some to be saved. A 10-year challenge is just simply this. I want to spend the next 10 years of my life impacting as many souls for Christ as I possibly can. Father, I pray that you would indeed stir our hearts to activity. Lord, we know that you are active in this world. We know that the throne of God has lightnings and thunderings, that the Holy Spirit of God sees everything here on earth, and that you are longing right now for souls to be saved. And Lord, I know that you put me here, and you filled me with your Holy Spirit. We already have what we need to invite people to come and have freedom. Oh, Lord, would you stir us today to do the work that you have set us here to do?